The following proposal from Senator David Pocock has been received under Standing Order 75. Dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The rate of job seeker needs to be raised in order to lift more than three million Australians out of poverty and stop one in six Australian children growing up in poverty, given the current cost of living crisis that last night's budget forecast will worsen, with huge increases to energy costs, food and rent, amongst other essentials. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussions. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly and I call Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. Behind some of the welcome and big ticket items in last night's budget, like the new housing accord that aspires to deliver a million homes over the next five years, expanded childcare subsidies, more paid parental leave and cheaper medicine, there lies a bigger, much more worrying story. A story of rising inflation, rising interest rates, slowing GDP growth, rising unemployment and rising costs of living across the country. The last one is a real killer. A 56% forecast rise in electricity prices, a 44% forecast rise in gas prices, a jump in both groceries and rent. The Treasurer is saying we're unlikely, un unlikely to see a rise in real wages for at least another couple of years. But despite this acknowledgement, the government hasn't done anything in terms of raising the rate for JobSeeker, Ausstudy, or Commonwealth Rent Assistance. Now, I absolutely understand and commend the need for responsible economic management to live within our means and the many other phrases bandied around this place when it comes to the budget. But equally, I simply don't accept that we can let this crisis continue. The budget is about priorities and what we've heard from the new Labor government in their first mini-budget is that the three million Australians living in poverty are not a priority. The one in six children across Australia who are growing up in poverty are not a priority to the new government. We have to think about this in terms of the things that we are happy to spend money on. At a time when fossil fuel companies are pulling in record profits, we're still happy to subsidise them. We're still happy to pour money into things like the Middle Arm project, $1.9 billion here, um, a, few, a few billion dollars there for the, for the gas industry. But yet when it comes to Australians in our communities who desperately need the support we're silent. The government had an opportunity to increase JobSeeker. $48 a day is not enough to live on. We heard the government pat themselves on the back when that was indexed and went from $46 to $48. $48 is still nowhere near enough. And let's be clear, the choices that we make in this place and, and in the other place are keeping one in six children across Australia, one of the most wealthy countries in the world, living in poverty. This has huge implications, you know, not just for those kids' future, but for all of our futures, to have one in six children growing up in poverty, to have three million Australians living below the poverty line. We know times are tough. Here in the ACT, our frontline services are stretched to breaking point. Food pantries have massive lines, are battling to get enough staff. People with jobs are struggling. So how do, how do we not support people who are in between jobs 
looking for jobs, trying to get their lives back on track and to get back into the labour market. I really implore the government to think more about this. You're governing for the Australian people. You're answerable to those three million Australians that through your decisions are being left to live on $48 a day. Those one in six children who are growing up in poverty, whose whole, the rest of their life will be shaped by the experiences of growing up in poverty, of growing up not being able to afford things, of looking at their friends at school and asking, why can't I have that? Why do I have to live like that? These are the choices that we are privileged to make in this place. I implore the government to raise the rate before or at the next budget in May. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Pratt. Thank you to Senator Pocock for this motion. But I have to say there is not a day that goes by that I do, do not take this issue extremely seriously. We recognise that living on income support payments is extremely challenging. As a government, however, we face competing calls on the budget, which sadly we have to make very difficult choices on. In the budget that we have just done, we have sought uh, to put some money back in people's pockets, including through cheaper childcare, expanding paid parental leave, cheaper medicine, more affordable housing and to support uh, low-income households that are, in, uh, the, uh, that are earning wages. To, to demonstrate how complicated this issue is, and I, I don't mean to overstate it in terms of complexity, but the, the kind of way the issue has to be managed, 4.7 million Australians received a boost to their government payments just through the indexation adjustments made uh, in September this year. Now, I'm not saying that that fixes the problem, but what I'm saying to you is that that increase in and of itself adds about $10 billion worth of costs to the, to the bottom line of the budget over the forward estimate. And so when we look to supporting families and we look to supporting households, particularly the most vulnerable ones uh, in our society, we need to make sure that the changes that we make are sustainable. The rate will be considered again in the next budget. But there is little point, as we've had a history of doing, of having a one-off supplement uh, boost here or there, uh, if we are simply setting up a system that is unsustainable. I also think we need to look at the whole package of needs of a family, and it's important to recognise that it's not $48 a day. Uh, when we're dealing with families, we need to include your family tax benefits A and B, and that these are targeted payments, along with rent assistance, for low-income households. So when it comes to looking at government policies in the future in this regard, we need to be looking at the holistic system of the kind of support that people get. I would note in this regard that uh, the House of Representatives currently has an inquiry, for example, into Workforce Australia and is also doing an inquiry into Parents Next. Parents Next uh, has purportedly been a program to support parents with young children to get ready for re-entering the workforce, and it has had historically a whole bunch of mutual obligations attached to it, uh, which I might note uh, have been suspended in recent times. And I note in that context that 
uh, these programs like that uh, that have been driven by uh, the last government haven't really known whether they are a parenting support program or whether they are an employment pathway program. And I note in that regard that the resources that we put into parts of the uh, community for programs like that, the resources that we put into places like Medicare, they're only good if people can use them. They're only good if uh, and so we do need to continue to deliberate about where our funding is best spent in a social welfare and community sense. And that is why we are looking very actively at these issues, for example, uh, through uh, the inquiry in Workforce Australia in the lower house. We acknowledge uh, that the release of the Poverty in Australia report of Thank 2022, you, for Price. example. The time has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I too rise to speak on this MPI. And I'll, I'll start uh, through you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, to uh, the mover of this MPI, Senator Pocock. Um, and I, I will start by noting the change of tone from those opposite on this topic since, uh, since we were in government. There, when they were sitting on this side, it was all very easy. It was all very easy to throw round promises, to make claims, to, to push barrows that could never be fulfilled when you have to take a responsible economic approach to the budget. I mean, the sad reality uh, of what we've seen over the last 24 hours uh, in terms of cost of living pressures impacting all Australians, including those on, uh, on social welfare, is that there's very little in this budget for them. Uh, in fact, we've seen an abject failure on one of the key promises uh, surrounding energy costs. And we've seen uh, the abject failure today, just today, of the Treasurer in explaining the promise to deliver a $275 uh, reduction in electricity costs, which would make a difference, particularly, particularly to low-income Australians. $275 would have made a real difference to low-income Australians. But the Treasurer today, in his, his mishearing of a question uh, in the press club and, and his, his uh, subsequent response in question time, shows that He's not even sure if the $275 was in the budget or wasn't in the budget. And if it was in the budget, then it was clearly a broken promise because the budget shows that electricity prices are going to rise. They're going to rise, not, not, not just by a small amount, but by something like 50 per cent. Uh, and so You've seen in a situation where Australians, particularly low-income Australians, do rely on a budget taking these kinds of issues seriously, that uh, this government's failed the first test. It's failed the first test of achieving what it said it was going to achieve, and it's, it, it's failed the test of competence in answering questions on what are very straightforward issues. Are they going to deliver the 275? Is it in the budget or not? These aren't complex questions. These are easy questions. And a lot of Australians, including Australians on income support, would like the answer to them. And unfortunately, we just get confusion from the Treasurer. Now, uh, in the few minutes remaining to me, I just do want to set the record straight on the issue, because sometimes um, there's a lot of misinformation distributed about the coalition government's record in this area. Uh, in particular, in the last couple of years of the government, the coalition government provided unprecedented payments uh, right across the economy to assist those on low incomes, to assist those on welfare, to assist those uh, uh, who were doing it very, very tough in an unprecedented time. In fact, $32 billion in emergency support payments, which the which the current government now often labels as wasted spending or, or somehow uh, poor expenditure of money. 
At the time, of course, they, they supported it, and, uh, and it kept the economy strong. In fact, we delivered an economy that was in very good shape, an economy that was growing, an economy that had delivered record low unemployment, growing, uh, job, uh, growing numbers of people in jobs, and uh, extraordinary opportunities in the economy for people who were looking for a job. So the coalition government uh, also delivered uh, the first increase in support payments uh, since, I believe, uh, don't quote me on this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right, since um, 1986. So the coalition government actually had a very proud record in this area. We also made it clear to the Australian people that there were economic headwinds, including inflation, uh, and that um, a sensible response by the Commonwealth Government was required as we shepherded the economy forward. Now that is the challenge of the Labor government, and they failed the first test. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Rice. Acting Deputy President, last night we watched the Treasurer, Mr. Dr. Chalmers, and the Labor government deliver a budget that's going to give tax cuts of $9,000 a year to the wealthy, to billionaires, to everyone in this place. Tax cuts of $9,000 a year while doing absolutely zero in the budget last night for the millions of Australians who are absolutely struggling to survive on income support. This was a Labor government budget. What is the point of Labor? Poverty is a political choice, and Labor last night showed they had made their choice. In this budget, they have chosen to give tax cuts to the wealthy at the cost of $254 billion over the next 10 years, rather than do anything for the millions of Australians, including the one in six children in Australia, who are living in poverty. This is not complex. These are people who are absolutely struggling. Every day, millions of Australians are having to make decisions as to whether they eat, whether they pay for their medicines, whether they pay for their rent. I recently spoke to one person struggling to survive on the job seeker payment who told me, I'll be 63 in a couple of weeks. No one will employ me at my age. I went food shopping the other day. For the first time in my life, I contemplated shoplifting because I could not afford the food I wanted to buy. My next-door neighbour is, is older, an ex-tradie. His knees and back are gone due to hard work. He's a year away from the pension. He is shoplifting food to survive, and he's giving me some of it. I volunteered all my life, but due to a bad motorbike accident that almost severed my right hand 10 years ago, I've had to stop doing that. I was a volunteer wildlife rescuer. I volunteered for the women's hospital, the children's hospital, op shops. When I lived in a regional town, I volunteered with the CWA, the CFA, the SES. I've consistently put back into society, and now I and many like me have been left behind on the scrap heap, forced to contemplate breaking the law to eat. I would prefer my name remain anonymous, as I don't want people to know that I'm considering stealing food. I don't want that stigma attached to me, even though I'm living a stigmatised life while I'm job seeker. Raise the rate and lower the retirement age. I'm tired. We are living in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, yet people are forced to shoplift to eat. And there are tax cuts that are going to give the wealthy a $9,000 a year extra in their pocket, delivered last night in a Labor budget. The budget also told us that rents are in increasing sharply, that electricity is going to go up 56 per cent. This budget does not cater for people who are just barely scraping by. It punishes people living in poverty. If this had been a Greens budget, there would have been different choices being made. It would have included a livable income guarantee, ensuring support was there for everyone who needed it. Because poverty is a political choice. We would raise the rate of job seeker to above the poverty line, to above $88 a day, 
abolish all punitive parts of our income support system and return the provision of employment system services back to the Commonwealth. And our livable income guarantee would sit side by side with the Greens' plans to build a million affordable homes to increase wages and reduce the costs of essential services like dental care and childcare by making them free. I mean, we know this is possible if we are willing to make the billionaires and the big corporations and the very wealthy pay their fair share rather than giving them tax cuts. Instead, we are pay going to be paying out hundreds of billions of dollars in tax cuts. I mean, lifting people out of poverty can be done. We saw during the height of the pandemic the government double job seeker above the poverty line and abolish all mutual obligations. And during this time, people were able to improve their lives, meet their basic needs, and their mental and physical health improved. Advocacy groups, people living in poverty, have repeatedly called on Labor to raise the rate of income support. Yet Labor has failed to listen, and this budget has done nothing to improve the lives of the 5.1 million Australians struggling to survive on meagre income support payments. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Babette. Thank you. Now, Labor's budget is a disaster. The cost of living is going up. Power prices are going up. Taxes are going up. Unemployment is going up. The only thing that isn't going up are your wages. Now, this Labor government continually promises to reduce the cost of living while simultaneously increasing the cost of living. Their strategy to lower prices is to increase prices. I can't for the life of me work out which is more incredible. The claims that this Labor government makes or the fact that this government expects Australians to believe their claims. Now, during the election, Labor promised many times that they would reduce the cost of power prices by approximately what, well, by $275. Instead, they're set to go up by more than 50 per cent. Now, this Labor government insists, insists that renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy, or at least it will be, just as soon as they spend $10 billion here and another $10 billion there. You know what? There seems to be a direct relationship between how much of our money Labor spent on their renewable energy fantasy and how many times they assure us that it result in cheaper power. It'll just take a few more billion dollars, as always. Now, if you believe that, if you believe that, you have the one prerequisite necessary to do the energy minister's job. And what is that prerequisite? Well, it is wishful thinking. That's what it is. Now, the energy crisis, which in turn is increasing the cost of everything else, has nothing to do with Vladimir Putin and the war in Ukraine, like some would have you believe. Labor made its promise to reduce power prices after Russia invaded the Ukraine. It has everything to do with Labor, the Greens and the Closet Greens on all sides of this chamber who are sabotaging cheap energy in this country. Now, while Australia is pursuing, frankly, crazy climate policies, China is building more than half the world's coal-fired power plants, strengthening their economy, increasing their standard of living. At the same time, the price of food is going up, partly because of floods, but mostly because of the skyrocketing cost of energy, making it more and more expensive to get Aussie food onto supermarket shelves. And now, for good measure, the Labor government also wants to lower methane, which will almost certainly become a tax on cows farting. That's what's going to happen, a tax on cows farting. It's going to dry up the cost of your average Aussie barbecue at the same time. Now, the soaring cost of living is not just a problem for the unemployed, it is a problem for everyone. Families paying off a mortgage, pensioners, retirees trying to keep cool in summer and warm in winter, businesses trying to employ people, everyone. In fact, as energy 
prices go through the roof, manufacturers are going to be forced to go offshore, probably to China, because China isn't crippled by crazy climate policies, which obviously results in unaffordable energy, and it is becoming harder, obviously, for businesses to keep the doors open and the lights on. Now, the real solution to the cost of living crisis is not a handout. It is affordable energy, getting rid of red and green tape and keeping government spending and taxes low so that Australia can be a land of opportunity. Raising the rate of job seeker is not a viable long-term solution. We absolutely have a responsibility to keep disadvantaged Australians um, well looked after. But the best way to do this is by creating conditions in which industry can thrive so that they can be gainfully employed. It is industry that creates jobs, not government. Now, increasing the size of our welfare programs will raise our already unsustainable debt level further. This will inevitably lead to high taxes and it will make it harder for families and pensioners to look after themselves and harder for business to employ people. The government can't have skyrocketing power prices and a generous welfare system. The government can't trash our competitive advantage, which is cheap, reliable, abundant energy in the form of coal and gas and then expect people to prosper. Thank you, Senator Babette. Your time has expired. And if no one else wants to call, the time for the discussion has expired. The President has also received the following letter from Senator Dean Smith. Pursuant to Senate Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Albanese Labor government has delivered a high-taxing, high-spending budget that has no plan to address the cost of living crisis, predicts 140,000 Australians losing their jobs, slashes funding to regional and rural Australia, breaks Labor's promise to the Australian people to reduce power prices by $275 annually, instead hiking power prices by 50 per cent, and a budget that has left Australians poorer, with the average family being at least $2,000 off worse by Christmas. Is the proposal supported? So, Could I just ask, seek some clarification in terms of a vote on the motion from Senator Pocock? Is that Senator Rice, it's a matter of public importance, so it wasn't a vote. Votes happen when there's a matter of public urgency. They're different. They're treated differently. Uh, so the proposal is supported. There were five people standing. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I hope Australian families know how to swim, because the Labor Treasurer of just six months standing, Mr Jim Chalmers has thrown them in the deep end and is not offering them a lifeline. Not offering them a lifeline. This afternoon you'll hear coalition senators, Labor senators, make their contributions, their observations about last night's budget. But let me share with the Chamber what the Daily Telegraph had to say today. Bug all. That's what the budget does to combat intense cost of living pressures being felt right now. But Jim Chalmers argues new immediate help would do more harm than good by adding to inflation. No lifeline for Australian families. The Financial Review this morning said the Albanese government has warned of hard days to come as it laid the groundwork for an agenda of tax increases and spending cuts, with a federal budget that forecasts debt and deficit over the next decade to be worse than just six months ago, and no lifeline for Australian families. The Australian newspaper has said today Jim Chalmers puts hard calls on hold in a forgettable economic statement. I think Labor took a huge liberty last night, took a huge liberty over the last six months by calling, preparing the country for a budget which at best was an economic statement at worst, provides no confidence to Australian families as they face the very real, immediate impacts of rising cost of living. And then finally, Sky News has said this budget is about giving with one hand to families and telling them, on the other hand, power prices are going to take it away again, if not more. 
Six months ago, Australian families put their faith in Labor. Labor's narrow election victory carried the hopes of many ordinary Australian families and what they got last night, the news that they woke up to this morning, is that the priorities and the needs of Australian families are of no interest to Labor, are of no interest to Anthony Albanese, are of no interest to Jim Chalmers. What did the budget say last night? The budget added to those 97 occasions already where Labor had promised a 275 cut in power prices. This budget confirms a more than 50 per cent increase in energy prices. Labor had promised to the Australian people in the lead-up to the election campaign there would be an improvement in real wages. The budget showed that real wages are going backwards. The budget also showed that Labor has dumped the tax cap and Labor's plans are to deliver a sneaky new tax on investors and retirees. Let's see how far that goes when that particular Treasury bill comes to the Senate. The situation facing Australian families is stark. Petrol is on the rise, mortgage costs are on the rise, food is on the rise. And Mr Chalmers and the Prime Minister have decided that Australian families should suffer, that Australian families should be the front line of this country's defence in these challenging economic times. In his first speech as Prime Minister-elect on election night, Mr Albanese, the Prime Minister, made it very, very clear made it very, very clear to Australians who did vote for him, but also Australians that didn't vote for him, what his core promise would be. What his core promise would be. He said, no one would be left behind because we should always look after the disadvantaged and the vulnerable. He went on to say, he went on to promise that no one will be held back because we should always support aspiration and opportunity. And at the first opportunity, Labor had to put its values on display to our country, it decided it would not provide much needed support. It would not provide a lifeline to Australian families. It is a shocking, rude, sad revelation. Australian families would have gone to bed last night, woke up this morning realising that the future is bleak ahead of them. Senator Sheldon. Uh, Acting Deputy President, yeah, I, I said you know, we've been here before, you know, hearing this cost of living arguments from the opposition. You know, I've, I've said you know, they lean in with their chin. Last time they leaned in with their entire body. Now the whole team of them are throwing themselves over the cliff. Like to think mm -hmm. that these people have no shame. They come here and lecture the Australian people what they demanded for this last election, which we delivered last night as a mistake. See, these are the people that brought a trillion dollars debt and showed nothing for it. They show absolutely nothing for it. These are the people that had a design feature for low wages. They said low wages is a design feature of how they are going to run the economy. And guess what? That's what we've got from them. That's what the consequences are. These are the same people that have seen for the first time in the history of this country the middle class shrinking under their watch, and they're coming here and lecturing us about what should or shouldn't be done. Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting. They have no policies. Remember that was official? They have no policies. They've got no plan. They've got no thought. They've got no strategy, because we know the strategy they've adopted has done over people in this country now for nine years. And of course, then you say you look at some of the areas where change has taken place. But think about what they've done in the aged care sector. Think about what their position was about the aged care sector. No support for aged care workers, feminised industries. Think about all the low-paid workers, men and women of this country, when they, uh, the, the proposition for a dollar an hour wage increase. Where were they? They opposed it. They opposed it. And they come in here 
with no shame, every one of them, and say that they have a position that's right. Well, quite clearly, in the budget last night, there's a whole series of critically important pieces that will make a change and a difference for thousands and millions of working Australians and people in our community. The cheaper childcare strategy. I mean, quite clearly, there are going to be millions of people that are going to be better off as a result of the early education program. That is an investment in the future, not money given off to Alan Joyce when, with no accountability, $2 billion, not something where you know, uh, we can watch and see you know, the, the, um, some of the you know, biggest names in some of the companies around this country which were given uh, billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, to turn around and, and spend on bogus training po packages. I mean, I mean, look, no offence to Grill, I occasionally eat their burgers myself. But I tell you what, giving them millions of dollars to set up a burger university to train people for just cheap labour, that's the strategies they have. The difference for us is that we have a clear strategy. 180,000 places, fee-free for TAFE, and vocational educational places. That will give capacity for our economy. It will give ability for people to earn more. It will give an opportunity for our economy to turn around and have the skilled labour that we need to have from Australians. And those 20,000 new university places over the next two years, again, it's investment in our future. It's an investment in right now. It means that money that would be coming out of people's pockets to do those things aren't happening, but it's value-adding to the economy. It's value-adding to households. And of course, expanding the paid parental leave to six months. Where are they about that? You, you don't think that's a cost of living saving? You don't think that's actually an advantage for people, women in particular, but for men and women in our community? You don't think that's an important gender equity question, which actually has value right across the economy? Or, more, of course, more affordable housing. More affordable housing. I mean, that, seriously, you're going to sit here and say to the government, as the ex-government, the ones that shrunk the middle class, said low wages as a strategy, have turned around and given us this housing crisis, then when we're coming up with solutions from our side, that that is not a solution that's actually affecting the cost of living? Well, of course it is. It logically is. It has the capacity to. It has the obvious support that will have that, uh, that outcome. And of course, getting wages missing, uh, moving will be the great example that there'll be the real test for these people with no shame. That will be the real test to see whether they support improvements in employment relations arrangements in this country that will finally get wages moving and not put it off to the never-never, do it as quickly and as smartly and as effectively as we possibly can to make sure Australians get a better and a fairer go. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak in favour of the matter of public importance moved by Senator Smith. This budget contains page after page of regulations and schemes designed to centrally manage the economy and extra bureaucrats to make sure that happens. Missing from this budget is real infrastructure. Queensland has lost Hell's Gates Dam, despite a business case that clearly showed the dam will provide a return on investment. And I thank the Senate for agreeing this afternoon to my document discovery to bring that report to the public. Urana Dam funding has been cancelled, a dam that would have grown Australia's high-value agriculture industry and make a substantial contribution to the government's own target of $100 billion of agricultural output at Farmgate. Hewenden Irrigation Project, a wonderful project in North Queensland, has been deferred despite the agricultural potential of the Flinders River Black Soil Plains to bring prosperity to our north. Queensland deserves better than Labor government that hates agriculture. Energy is missing from this budget. Nature-dependent power currently receives $13 billion a year in renew renewable energy subsidies. If the, nature of nature in the, na if the number of nature-dependent power plants is to increase to meet the 2030 target, then the allowance for the increase in subsidies should be showing in this budget. Yet it's not. Where is the baseload power generation? Nowhere. Blackouts, here we come. In Wednesday's financial review, the ABS 
announced that power prices in the September quarter rose 15.6 per cent, or 60 per cent annualised. This is a catastrophe for struggling families and small businesses. How can any business have the confidence to invest when they see a basic business input blowing, with no, blowing out with no end in sight? This budget is an economic suicide note. One Nation support productive capacity, less red tape, creating wealth and a future for everyday Australians who are the core of our nation. Senator Macdonald. No, Senator Brown. Oh, no, yes, it is Senator Macdonald. Sorry. Thank you very much. This budget, I, I rise with, with great pleasure to speak to this MPI as proposed by Senator Smith, because this budget is a, truly a fabrication, uh, a, a paper mache collection of lies and mistruths. Uh, the Labor Party, the uh, government now, went to the last election uh, with a whole series of commitments and promises which they have one by one broken, whether it be uh, Rockhampton Ring Road funding, whether it be uh, the capital of Israel, whether it be uh, funding for various projects where they led Australians on and uh, made the, um, the commitment that they would be supporting particularly regional Australia. This budget is actually uh, has more income than the last budget. It's up by $50 billion thanks to commodity prices. But what has the government done with that increased income? Well, they've spent it. They've spent it. <clears throat> so spending is up from $628 billion to $651 billion. And that's not talking about the balance sheet items, the $20 billion for the power grid sp expenditure, $15 billion for the reconstruction funding and another $10 billion. This budget is based on inflation increasing effectively to 7.75 per cent by the end of this year, but the government projects that by next year it will have fallen to 3.5 per cent, which seems a bold a very bold statement to make. Real wages will continue going backwards. Wages will increase by 3.75 per cent, but that is not going to meet the inflation figures. People will lose jobs uh, in 2023, according to Labor, based on the predicted unemployment rate of 4.5 per cent, 140,000 people out of work. I think this is a budget that is misleading in the extreme, because what, what has happened is that money has been ripped out of productive projects, projects that you would invest in if you were building a nation, if you were looking to the future. What this is is a Robin Hood budget that steals jobs from the future, but I just don't know who they are giving them to. Uh, families will be $2,000 worse off under Labor by Christmas. Uh, we already pay more in the regions, but this is going to increase. We pay more for fuel, for groceries, for insurance, for electricity, for airfares. But to Labor's eternal shame, they looked Australians in the eye, they begged for their vote and promised, in exchange for that, a reduction of electricity prices by $275 per year. Now, uh, Minister Gallagher has told us that that $275 reduction is in the budget. She said that today at question time, that it's in the budget. And I look forward to having that being explained further to me. Labor's telling regional people and businesses here that a ward 12,000 kilometres away is why they have to break a key election promise made 97 times. And regional people have a nose for political spin, and these excuses stink. Power prices going up by more than 50 per cent, gas prices going up by more than 40 per cent, taxes up, employment up, interest rates up, inflation up. But there's one thing that's not going up. Under Labor, real wages are not going up. <sighs> Labor wants to cut Australia's methane emissions, but this will be impossible if they continue with these excuses and lies. And on the upside, at least our meat herds won't need culling. We'll just need Labor to stop talking. Regions have smaller populations. I wonder if those opposite would like the opportunity to speak, because they're certainly speaking a lot now. No? Thank you. 
Regions have smaller populations, businesses have static customer numbers, and an increase in costs will push them to the wall. 50 per cent increase on power prices will result in business closures, jobs lost and uh, increasingly difficult circumstances thanks to the headlong rush to emissions reductions without a plan, without a plan to genuinely transition the economy. Local butchers and pubs will have to charge people more and put people off staff. Why do regions matter? Well, for Labor, a small town is just a photo opportunity, but so much more for the people, businesses and councils that live and operate there. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I, that contri contribution by Senator MacDonald was like we were in some sort of twilight zone. Um, um, that she talked about interest rates rising, cost of living rises, real wage increases, when after uh, 10 years of uh, a coalition government, their whole, um, their whole deliberate uh, act design feature of their budget was to keep wages low. It's extraordinary, that contribution. It, it completely ignores Act, the actual facts of um, what this um, a decade of wasted opportunities and wrong, wrong priorities that this um, coalition government let, uh, left us in. And let's not forget, they did leave us with a trillion dollars worth of debt uh, without much to show for it. And I have to say, I have to say, I was so uh, proud to be in the other place last night to hear our treasurer deliver the 2022-23 budget speech. It's for the first time in 10 years a Labor budget was presented to the people of this country, a budget which is responsible, right for the times and ready for the future. Making good decisions now is critical to making sure no one is held back and no one is left behind. Because much of what we presented last night was motivated by cost of living and pressures faced by Australians around the country, brought about by the lingering impacts of the pandemic, the war in the Ukraine and by natural disasters at home, leading to pressures on supply chains and prices. Budgets at their best bring together the global and the local. This budget delivers for all Australians, helping them manage the cost of living pressures and plans for the future with our five-point uh, cost of living plan. Cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, expanding the paid parental leave to six months, more affordable housing and getting wages moving again. Our plan for cheaper childcare will support families and deliver an economic dividend. The $4.5 billion plan will cut, cut the cost of early education and care for around 1.26 million Australian families, easing the cost of living pressures, giving children access to critical early education and giving parents the opportunity to work and earn more if they want to. And we're making medicines cheaper for Australian households. For the first time in its 75-year history, the maximum cost of general scripts under the PBS will fall. We are delivering $531 million investment to, to expand the paid parental leave system up to 26 weeks by July 2026. This is the biggest boost to Australia's paid parental leave scheme since it was created by who? The former Labor government in 2011, because the other side, the coalition government, they don't create, they don't create those, project, those uh, programs that make significant real change in people's lives. So this, the extension will support parents to spend more time with their children and share caring responsibilities more equally. We will also deliver 40,000 new social and affordable houses, including 30,000 from the Housing Australia Future Fund and an additional 10,000 dwellings under the new housing accord. And we will introduce measures to get wages moving again while ensuring a safer, fairer and more secure workplace. 
What, on top of the five-point plan for the cost of living, this Labor budget builds a stronger, more resilient and modern economy with investments so, in so many vital areas. Infrastructure is critical to building the nation, as we all want, um, and the Albanese government's investment in infrastructure will deliver the best outcome for the Australian people now and into the future. The budget takes an important first step in ensuring the Commonwealth's infrastructure spending is responsible, affordable and sustainable. We are delivering on our election promises, which takes the total investment in transport infrastructure in every uh, state and territory in this budget at $55 billion over the forward estimates for new and existing projects. Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, uh, in the words of the Treasurer from last night, this budget is uh, solid, steady and sensible. I think it's probably a fair yarn to say it, uh, it's in that sort of solid and steady territory. There's a lot, not a lot that's new here. Uh, it's not particularly bold or, or visionary. Um, but I do, take, uh, I do take umbrage with the word sensible. I don't think it's sensible to be spending $240 billion on tax cuts that are mostly going to benefit the wealthy in this country. And nor do I think it's sensible in a time of climate emergency to be uh, spending $40 billion plus on fossil fuel subsidies, including billions of dollars in direct corporate welfare from the taxpayer to facilitate fossil fuel projects. And to put that in perspective, you know, $40 billion versus, in this budget, a $97 million over four years contribution to the Great Barrier Reef. Now, Acting Deputy President, um, I support money going to the Great Barrier Reef. It's not going to fix the problem, because only acting on emissions is going to fix the problem, so no more new uh, oil and gas and coal, but I do support that money going to the Barrier Reef. The Barrier Reef is, is clearly uh, a World Heritage listed uh, international gem. Uh, it contributes $6.4 billion annually uh, to this country's GDP and it employs 64,000 people. So it is by no means uh, it is a very important uh, that we try to do whatever we can to help the Great Barrier Reef. But I wanted to raise today that there's no money in this budget for the Great Barrier Reef's southern sister, the Great Southern Reef, which spans from New South Wales down through Victoria, Tasmania, across to South Australia. This system of reefs, these temperate reefs, contribute nearly $10 billion annually, nearly double what the Great Barrier Reef contributes to our economy. And of course, they're absolutely critical ecosystems. So it's disappointing that there's nothing in here for the Great Southern Reef. And you look at the money that's going to the Great Barrier Reef, for example, $1.6 billion that the government has spent in the last five years. What have they spent? on the Great Southern Reef, around $30 million only. And if you look at one of the programs on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in recent years have gone to tackling the Crown of Thorns outbreak on the Barrier Reef, but only $4 million over 20 years to tackle Centrus Stephanus, the long-spined sea urchin that is creating barrens in our oceans and devastating commercial fisheries, ecosystems and local communities. So there's a lot the government's got to do to actually uh, fund research and adaption measures down in the Great Southern Reef. There's amazing people down there. You're going to be hearing a lot more from the Greens on this in the months to come, and we're looking forward to getting some budget outcomes uh, in the next few years. The time has expired, as... Senator Wish Wilson. I call Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, the Treasurer had his big night last night, uh, if you think. We're disappointed by this budget. You can't imagine the disappointment that the Australian people must be feeling, indeed those in my home state of Western Australia. All this budget did tell those in Western Australia is that there is much more financial hurt and pain for their household budget. Be in no doubt we are in a cost of living crisis. Things are getting a lot worse before they're going to get better. Cost of living is going up, power prices are going up, gas prices are going up. Taxes are going up. Western Australians will have to spend more in their budgets just to be able to make ends meet. 
Now, one reliable way of putting downward pressure on inflation is to put a limit on spending. But what we're seeing is that this budget contains measures that are actually going to put an upward pressure on inflation. Let me give you an example. We've got $4.5 billion in here for a so-called cheaper childcare. Now, that sounds noble. That sounds noble. Uh, but what we know is that by this government's own admission is that this policy will not add a single childcare place. Worse still, it's likely to drive up the cost of childcare, swallowed up by the increased subsidy. Uh, the increased subsidy will be swallowed up and will have further inflationary impacts. Now, on the issue of no extra places, can someone from the Labor Party please explain to someone that's living in a childcare desert how an increased subsidy is going to help their cost of living if they can't actually access a childcare place in the first place? Now, despite uh, ruling it out before the election, what we've seen is that the retiree tax is back. Labor's sneaky new tax will slug people who invest their own savings in superannuation, people who have worked hard and saved for a better retirement. Labor will now hit retirees and investors with a new $555 million tax, depriving investors of franking credits which they have previously relied on. This government has been in power for just five months. In that time, we've seen interest rates rise five consecutive months. Now that's an increase of 2.25 per cent in five months, the most rapid increase in nearly three decades. Inflation is out of control. Before the last election, the then opposition leader repeatedly told Australians that Labor would cut power prices for families and small businesses by $275. And despite the Treasurer telling the National Press Club today that it was in the budget, Labor have not included it. It's a broken promise. And now when Australians think that it couldn't get much worse under this government, this government turns around and slashes funding for rural and regional Australia with the abolition of the coalition government's Building Better Regions Fund, the BBRF. Now, this is a great program which supported Australians living in non-metropolitan regions. It highlights that this government is completely city-centric. It, it's very clear in this budget that this budget is all about helping the re-election campaign of the Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews. In the electorate of O'Connor, in the electorate of O'Connor in, in Western Australia, there were 20 BBRF. Uh, round, round six applications, two of which were in the Shire of Catanning's application to, uh, to facilitate an early childhood hub, and then also one in the Shire of Laverton's application to facilitate an upgrade of the airport uh, at, at Laverton. Now, these are the kind of important projects that are needed by these local communities, which will now miss out by Labor's poor treatment of regional Western Australia. Last night's budget. Last night's budget was a missed opportunity. A missed opportunity. It further underlined that this government is very good at talking, but slow on taking responsibility, slow on bringing forward a plan to make life better and to make life better for those in Western Australia. Just they're just they're not providing for the for our communities. There is real pain in this budget. Make no doubt about that. And for this Christmas, for this year's Christmas, Western Australian families will know it will be very different to the previous years. Instead, this government is too busy rewriting history books and blaming everyone else for the job that they have been elected to do. Thank you. Given that the time for the MPI has expired,